So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good morning. Um, can I welcome you today to our discussion of the idea of the Silk Road, part of the Aga Khan Foundation's um, series of talks on the Silk Road and, um, and the and inter intercontinental um, connectivity. Um, the Silk Road is a term that's appealing and widely recognized. It purports to give a long history to the trading connections across Eurasia. And for some commentators, it seemed to evoke a deeper history to contemporary hopes for pluralism and tolerance. So it's been an attractive term for policymakers and diplomats, as well as for cultural institutions. But we seek today to give you a taster of how historians have discussed this term um, both with regard to the pitfalls of terminology surrounding the Silk Road, and also the way that the term has been used in contemporary um, contexts by politicians and by the heritage industry. So we're going to open our discussion today with Khodadad Reza Khani's discussions of the pitfalls of a Eurocentric terminology. We're going to move to Arazu Azad's discussion of how trade can actually be documented for Iran and Central Asia. And we're going to conclude um, with Aslisho Korboniev and Zhang Zhang discussing how the term, the terminology of the Silk Road has been used in Chinese, Central Asian and Russian contexts. So without further ado, I bring you Khodadad Reza Khani. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wood, for your um, uh, introduction. I I also want to uh, thank Dr. Savant for um, putting together um, such an interesting meeting. And I uh, hope to be able in 10 minutes to tell you basically the um, main topics that um, I want to touch on. And I hope that would be a good introduction to the works of my learned friends and colleagues uh, who are present here. So, um, as um, the title, you can see the gravy train and the bandwagon. I'm actually borrowing from the um, uh, famous um, archaeologist and historian of Central Asia, Warwick Paul, uh, who called the Silk Road both a gravy train and a bandwagon. And I'm uh, going to provide a general overview of why I think this is a problematic term in historiographical sense and what it does really to our understanding of Central Asia and uh, Iran and, uh, well, really the greater Western and Central Asian uh, space. And um, 
what is the, what is the Silk Road and what is it really good for? Um, there is an assumption that the Silk Road is an ancient trade route that um, connects the East and the West. And they, both of the East and the West here, I would put in um, sort of quotation marks. Uh, and that this has been going on well for a long time. And there have been various dates proposed, um, 2000 years, 2300 years. There are uh, standard descriptions of the Silk Road often mentioned also uh, in uh, um, uh, exchange of ambassadors with the, um, between the uh, Han rulers of China and uh, Parthian, um, our Sassid Empire of Iran as an opening of the Silk Road. Um, and uh, really the foundation of something like that. But as you can see in this introductory slide, what I want to go through is how this is used rather in a modern sense uh, as a world historical device. Uh, and what it really tells us about how uh, history is seen uh, in a modern sense. And what it does to Central and West Asia, as I call here, uh, where connecting the East and the West and uh, China and Rome is made the main thing. And the Silk Road is reduced to a collection of oases, flyover lands, uh, in which um, uh, the trade is the only determining factor. And also things such as the Chinese records are manipulated uh, to show these connections to the West. Uh, and of course, in a new sense, it, had, it is a concept that is used for um, political, economic, and other purposes which um, uh, our um, presenter, um, Zhang Zhang, could uh, talk about in uh, more detail, but such as the One Belt, One Road uh, program of the Chinese government. Uh, but in reality, this is really what um, the Silk Road is doing. Um, the Silk Road is a 19th century concept. It was created really out of a fascination of the Europeans with the Orient and a rediscovery of the um, East, a going of the East and seeing how the East also equals the West. And in this sense, I, I'm, I'm, I'm overemphasizing the words, but people like Sven Hedin and their, uh, his travels to the East and collection of information that he brought to Europe in the 19th century really ends up in the creation of the name, the Seidenstrasse in German, which is really paralleling the idea of the Amber Road from the ba uh, Baltic to the Roman Empire. And it really is a word that um, Ferdinand von Richthofen um, uses in order to create the concept of the uh, uh, trade routes that connect various um, entities together, particularly in this sense, um, uh, China and the West. And as I am in this map, you see, this is, I'm calling it the Romanizers model of the world, and I will talk about this a bit more uh, later. But the question that this brings up is, okay, if it is a 19th century concept, why does it thrive today? What purpose does it um, serve? And the matter is that the modern historiography is a bit, uh, well, it's quite a bit conscious of its own Eurocentrism. Uh, it's always in the, because in research, a lot of the historiography that we are used to is the history of the rise of the West. Uh, how did Europe become the dominant power of Western, um, of the world? How did it become the uh, determining factor in the, um, in modernity, in the rise of, uh, um, you know, uh, standards of living and uh, rise of material, uh, progress and in teaching generally also teaching of history has been very Eurocentric in the sense of being the story of the Western civilization. So something like the Silk Road very quickly um, gives results of um, uh, satisfying results for including the non-European world. In this case, in particular China, because in a sense, uh, it is still the same story, still the same story of the rise of the uh, West, but it is bringing the rest, a bit of the rest, to the fore, and is giving a um, legitimacy and a sense of inclusion. Uh, and it does in the way of creating a parallel to the West in the sense of China, and whatever connects it, which is the Silk Road. But uh, it also has, an, uh, has a generally main issue, is that 
uh, it assumes that the West, that Europe, was always the determining factor in world economy, that um, um, there was always a Europe as a market for um, the world's production, whether it is in manufactured production or just the trade of the goods. And that uh, Western entities such as Rome, the Mediterranean, is exactly uh, where everything was, one tip was ending up. And so uh, it is the destination for the goods of China as well. But this also creates the problem that it's um, in describing the route that supposedly goes from China to the West, it creates images of what this West is. And it does stuff such as, uh, where is exactly the West that this goes to? Is it the Parthian Empire? Is it the supposed partners of China in foundations, uh, foundation of the Silk Road? Or is it really the Roman Empire? And because it imagines that the Roman Empire is the natural terminal part of this, that you know, it was the pool of the Mediterranean economy as a market that uh, helps create this, it also falls into the problem of defining the route. So as you can see in these uh, maps, the last two maps I showed you, this one and this one, there is a problem of exactly what is the, what is the Silk Road? Where does it pass? Hmm. Um, this is the, where you find the um, southern and the northern and the mountain and even the sea silk uh, that everybody creates. And the descriptions are sometimes become quite interesting. Uh, where does it go from? Does it stop, st um, start from the traditional capital of a lot of medieval Chinese entities, uh, Xi'an or Chang'an? How does it proceed? Exactly where does it go? And then how, what does it do to the entities in between? So the areas that are, are my concern, particularly, and which we will hear our, our colleagues talk about, Central Asia and Iran, how does this area connect to this area? And as you can see in these maps, the Western end of this is never that clear. It goes from China through either Northern or Southern routes through the Taklamakan Desert, to um, famed places such as Turfan, Kashgar, and it ends up in Samarkand, Marv, and Bukhara. But whatever it goes west, then it becomes a problematic term. And uh, it becomes a, a historical geography, because as you can see in this map, this map mentions Persepolis, mentions Tessiphon, the two centers that didn't exist together at all, makes, mentions Babylon. It supposedly goes to Istanbul, but it also mentions Tehran, the modern capital of Iran. Um, and it, it really, when it goes west of Iran, it really fails to quite make sense of its own existence, of its own description of what the Silk Road is. What I'm suggesting, what, I'm, what I, I think I look forward to our um, colleagues talking about is, what does it do as a historiographical this device? In assuming this west, East connections and that the Silk Road is a um, almost a paved road that brings the goods of China to the West, to the West with a W, to Europe, to Roman Empire, to the Mediterranean, it really blurs the history of whatever is in between. It ignores the fact that there is 4,000 kilometers between Bukhara and Istanbul. It really doesn't consider that these areas are themselves part of a very active history. It imagines them as stagnant parts of history where um, they only exist as in between places, as stations on the Silk Road, only there serving to uh, um, supposedly let the caravans pass. And what um, the image it creates really is the image of the um, trains of camels and traders going from China to the West or from the West supposedly to China. And all of these places in between Samarkand, Bukhara, Merv, um, uh, I don't know, even, even places like Turfan and Kashgar and Khotan, all of these places that we associate with very exotic things, it, it exoticizes them as well as if they purely exist to serve such a route. 
And I think in historiographical sense, this has resulted in us not seeing the history of these places, ignoring that they have their own historical presence, that they have their own political um, entities, they have their own um, uh, culture, and even in very serious studies of world history, reducing them into cleavage areas that are between different civilizations and don't serve anything but being part of a connection. I refrain here from criticizing terminology of uh, entities such as commercial empires or commercial populations like Sogdians or Bactrians, which are again only studied in the sense of their commercial activity. But in particular, I think the geography here is what I really like to point out as a, in, in fact, the most important thing that is going on. And the second thing is equating the East and the West of this entity as an equal partners and the dominating partners that the West, that the Roman empire is really the whole point of this thing. And China as the main manufacturer, which is very much a modern concept being reflected in ancient history um, is the main producer and the main consumer is China. And I think this map, which is um, in, in a sense um, humorous, uh, says a lot about this whole thing that we imagine this is, this is the entirety of the Roman empire fitting essentially within the, within the entirety of the Chinese uh, lands. And you see that um, the scales are quite different and us getting these two as uh, similar and as determining factors is really reflecting a modern understanding of history on ancient history, imagining that pre-1500 uh, European Mediterranean economic um, pool, post-1500 um, European uh, economic pool is something that existed since the time eternal and thus brings the Silk Road as a natural occurrence for Eurasian history, ignoring whatever is in it. So I shall stop here and pass on to my uh, colleague Arzu Azad, who will talk about more uh, on the uh, trade in Central Asia during this period. Okay, can you hear me, see me? Can someone give me an indication if it's all fine? Yes, perfect. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Khodadat. Uh, thank you, Philip, first of all, um, for introducing us. Thank you, Sarah, for organizing this, and Alex, who has been doing all the technical work in the background. And thank you to the organizers of this wonderful exhibition. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon as speaker on a subject that actually lies close to my heart. I remember growing up actually with a strong sense of belonging to the Silk Road, but not so much because I was of Iranian heritage, but because I was born and grew up in Germany where indeed it all started as Khudada just explained to us. Um, this is the only map I'll show you because uh, we've seen a lot um, of very good maps already. But I wanted to just add to what Chorodot already said, Ferdinand von Richthofen, who I've shown you here, an aristocratic Prussian geologist and scientist, had a vivid imagination and uh, on the lands of the Silk Road or the Seidenstraße. The term immediately conjures up this image that exudes passion, adventure, discovery, ingenuity, all of which comes to the fore in this wonderful exhibition of photos uh, by Christopher Wilton Steer that are on display at King's Cross and around this event, uh, around which this event has been organized. And it's a simple concept that tells a million tales, just like in the Arabian Nights. The idea being that this beautiful luxury item, silk, shimmering, colorful, and dazzling, was carried in massive convoys, as Khudadad mentioned too, led by camel loading traders across the Eurasian steppe from China to Iran and eventually to Europe, all in one continuous line. It implies grand power, royalty, grand strategy, a super highway of late antiquity, just like the red line drawn, drawn on this map. 
It's a positive image of a region that is otherwise riddled with bad press, you might say. So what's wrong with it, you might ask. First, let me say that I'm actually one of the historians who does see some merit in it. For one, the attractive label or brand has enabled colleagues to obtain funding for research on this otherwise understudied and little understood region. Similarly, within the arena of international policy and UN action, funding agencies are able to pool resources for the region, a region that is now broken up into many different nation states and their borders nowadays cut across ethnic and linguistic lines which in earlier times were not so clearly drawn economically, politically, culturally, and so on. So if we didn't have a Silk Roads program at UNESCO, for example, we might not have programs that take into account the cultural affinities and interactions that exist across these nation states. So that's a good thing. But what's bad about it for historians is that the Silk Road actually never existed, or rather we have no evidence for it. And history after all is detective work. We need evidence to build a convincing case. We can't find evidence for a massive superhighway, and silk, it turns out, is not the only, and indeed, not usually not the largest traded good. I'll show you some examples of this evidence in a minute. The main objective, uh, objection, sorry, of the Silk Roads concept is that it implies some kind of commonality about Oriental people. And here is our friend, um, uh, Edward Said. So the Orientalist approach is exactly what he, this famous Columbia professor, considered to be fundamentally racist and Eurocentric 40, 50 years ago. The area is huge, as um, Hododad has shown us in his many maps, and realities varied from place to place and over time. The Silk Road concept and label is often used in a way that glosses over these many histories, nuances and differences, and that is an erasure or a reduction of history. So if we fast forward to 2021, things have moved on since von Richthofen and even since Said. Here's an example of one of my colleagues, uh, Yale professor Valerie Hansen who together with her colleagues has taken took on the challenge of going through hundreds of documents from Dunhuang in China to see what we can learn about trade and whether there was this silk trade. The verdict is that yes there was trade in China and between China and the Middle East and yes lots of people were moving around, uh, pilgrims included, but there was no one long road only lots of little routes and stages. It was not all land-based either, as we just saw, there was maritime trade as well. And the main good, as I mentioned, was not silk. Here you can see the scholar Paul Pelio and the incredible amount of documents that was found in just one cave in Dunhuang. Hansen also highlights that you can find documents in the most unimaginable of places. One is on this slide. It's the so-called Tang Barbie doll. You can see her on the cover of her book, which is believed to be dated to the seventh century. Scientists discovered that her arms were covered in paper. When they unrolled it, they found that these were ancient pawn documents. You could learn about items that were pawned and by whom. From such documents, we know that much trade was actually local. Other documents that her team looked at are market registers. These list goods that were sold, vegetables, animals, textiles, and so on. And many were locally produced. And Hansen explains that the Tang government would send out thousands of bolts of silk indeed, but not as a, a, as a trade good, but as pay to its armies. Silk was much lighter than coin, so that made sense. Once paid, the soldiers then spent their money in local markets, which contributed to the prosperity of the region. So it was government spending, not private trade, 
that contributed greatly to the exchanges that the Silk Road exemplifies. But there's another fascinating thing about this door. It is also a testament to the arrival of goods from far away. Her, the top of her dress exhibits the latest Persian fashion of the seventh century. And um, with the dots that you can see around a bird, while her gauze shawl displays the latest Chinese fashion of the seventh century. So what about Central Asia and the Middle East? The mantra used to be that we had no evidence or very little. It had all been lost and we blamed the Mongols for it. There's no doubt that the Mongols caused massive damage in the region, but it was never as total as one might think. So actually, when you start looking, you find scraps of evidence here and there, just like with the Tang Barbie doll. And when reading them, you find that the story for the West along the Silk Road is no different. I should say here that our sources for this Western region have been far less understood or studied than the documents from Dunhuang. And it's actually the Invisible East program in Oxford that Zhang Zhang and I belong to um, that is currently collating all these documents. So I'm just gonna show you a few examples. From a similar period to the Chinese we just saw, we have documents like these. They're written in Bactrian, which is an ancient Iranian language that used a cursive Greek script. These documents come from what's today Afghanistan. Goods that we can read from these, that goods were traded, but they too were mainly local, locally produced food items, textiles and clothing, farming materials like hay and so on. If we go further west to what is today Iran proper, we have these documents that were written in Middle Persian, which is uh, an ancient Iranian language as well, using a, an, an, another script which that is called Pahlavi, but which dates to the eighth century from the early Islamic period. But here too, anyone looking for a Richthofian style Silk Road will remain disappointed. And what about a slightly later period? So these are documents that have received much press. Um, they are sales and exchange records, debt records and so on from 11th century Afghanistan in the Bamiyan area that point to an active trading community here. But again, their trade is limited to much shorter distance connections, neighboring and neighboring cities written mostly in Persian, some in Arabic, a number of them also written in Hebrew. You might be able to see that on the slide. Members of the Jewish community were landowners, moneylenders, and traders. So where does this leave us? Knowing that the Silk Road is not really about silk nor a road, what is it then? It's actually about people trading their goods locally and with the next nearest region along many small roads and paths crisscrossing each other. From one region, some of these goods may be picked up by another region. There may be metaphors and, the, and so on. So there are quite a few metaphors that might come to mind, but I was thinking of a swinging pendulum that starts with one ball and then once it hits the next ball, it becomes two and then it becomes three and then it becomes four and so on. So it's region, each ball being a region. So it's region by region and momentum is gained in different aspects of society. Trade is one. Another is the exchange of ideas, religious, cultural, scientific, and so on. These activities extend over many centuries and they take on different dynamics over time from place to place. And they depend on regular people as much as on rulers. What it means concretely is that we need to rethink trade and cultural exchange. And we need, to, we need to go down to the micro level, town by town, village by village, family by family to get the real picture. This micro historical approach is already in full swing in European historical studies through some wonderful works like Carlo Ginzburg's Of the Cheese and Worms. One important driver or facilitator here is the no local network the bonds that tied people together and through which monies could flow and transactions could be, inter, uh, could be made. We need to understand how these systems work. And this is my final 
slide. So what bound these people together and made the system work were loyalties that were expressed in documents. Here's a letter from the Afghan 11th century corpus that our team has recently deciphered. And I like it very much because it gives us a little bit of a sense of these kinds of loyalties. I'm gonna open them all up. Um, so the writer, a certain Abul Ghassim, clearly has a strong affinity towards his addressee. Tell them to stop bothering you, he pleads. Perhaps he's referring to loan sharks. I will take care of it, he reassures him, and please keep writing to me, and so on. It seems that the addressee has left his hometown and is in financial trouble, and the letter writer is clearly worried about his safety. The addressee is referred to as esteemed one and maybe a close friend or older relative. So here we go. I'm gonna end it here, but um, just to say, if you'd like to follow what we are doing in the Invisible East program, um, here are our details. And I will now happily pass on to, I believe it's Ashley Shaw next. It, it seems it's John. Hold on. John, John. John, John. Yes, it's my turn now. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to talk about one of my favorite topic, the popularization of the Silk Road. Why everybody loves the Silk Road. Uh, so as we mentioned that this word was coined by uh, Ferdinand von Richthofen in the 19th century, but he came to China as an imperialist. He was, he was uh, trying to see the possibility of building a, a railway from, from Germany to, to Qingdao, a, a German colony in China. So, so the purpose is uh, purely imperialistic, I think. And uh, a, a, a side project of this um, survey work is his idea of the Silk Road but it has a very specific time and location, time and region uh, uh, embedded in, in his ideas. The Roman Empire, Han Dynasty from 200 BCE to 200 CE, and the region is from Chang'an to Rome. We will see that this, this concept changes over time. But, uh, but, the, but the very word of the Silk Road, it, it has a very strong imperialistic taste just, just as the Gold Coast, the Slave Coast, and the Ivory Coast, it, it, it has a directionality connotated in it, meaning that the East is providing some kind of material to the West, but the West is providing like more uh, uh, cultural and, and political uh, stuff, uh, uh, order out of, out of the core. Uh, so it, it is a, a product of imperialism of the 19th century. But over time, this, this word uh, changes its meaning a little bit, uh, popularized by Sven Hedin, who traveled a lot, as you can see, in Central Asia and China uh, in the early 20th century. And he published books, uh, book after book, one of the books is called the Silk Road. By the way, he is a student of uh, Pistofen. So this is the word that uh, Sven Hedin used to, to, to denote the region that he traveled. So he used it as a kind of like a, as a marketing slogan, right? But there is a competing marketing slogan uh, coined by Oral Stein. He, he called this area between China and Iran, Central Asia, Xinjiang, Serendia, but this, this word is too, too difficult. So it, it didn't succeed. But after the exploration of Western China and Central Asia in the early 20th century, the Silk Road changes its meaning to mean uh, it expands time-wise to include the Tang Dynasty. So from 200 BCE to 900 CE, but it shrinks in terms of the region. It, uh, it refers to Central Asia and Western China. So this is a very narrow 
uh, definition of the Silk Road. But, this, but the Silk Road kind of expands, right? Now, now we have the Maritime Silk Road, we have the Amber Road, the Lapis Lazuli Road. So a, a joke I used to say is that, tell me a road nowadays that is not a Silk Road. Like every road is a Silk Road, especially nowadays the, the project the Chinese project of the One Belt, One Road initiative. I'll, we will look at this uh, in a moment. And also we have all kinds of um, artworks, documentaries. This is a very popular Japanese documentary, The Silk Road. And also, of course we have the uh, Silk Road Ensemble with Yo-Yo Ma and a very popular book by a colleague from Oxford. And now this is the, um, the one belt, one road map uh, uh, promoted by the Chinese government. You can see it, it basically includes half of the world, if not all of it. Um, uh, the, the belt is the route, it is the land route because it's, it's about, it includes all the regions along the route, but the road is the sea route. It only includes the port the ports, right? Because uh, on, on the ocean, there's no, no, no people, yeah. So that, that, that's the, the difference between the belt and the road. But why is this uh, concept so popular? I think the, the main reason is that it depicted a very rosy image of the past. Like if, if you think about the Silk Road, you will, it will conjure up an image of like a caravan of camels and then merchants and they're doing trades, making money. And uh, along the way, they, they were also um, expanding uh, the religion, the spiritual product. And, and, and the, the point is that these cultural exchanges are peaceful and non-political, right? But this is only a, a complementary part of the history of human history, because in the past the the main uh, motivator of history is military, is violent, is uh, is the political, is the political uh, motivator. But but the Silk Road reminds us not to ignore that apart from political and the military and the violent exchanges exchanges between peoples there still exist non-political and peaceful exchanges which are dependent on the political situation but nowadays people try to use silk road to to cover up the 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 ugly truth of the past trying to say oh all kinds of political all kinds of cultural exchanges were peaceful and people or doing trade, they were happy, but that's not that's not the case, right? Uh, and also, the Chinese government is, is also doing the same thing. Uh, it's trying to uh, promote its influence, but through this non-violent, non-political uh, way or or um, cover. Uh, and also, the Silk Road is a is a east-west uh, exchanges. But I think the main the main theme of the past is uh, is the um, conflict between north and south, between the nomadic and the settled. Um, so I think I can understand why people like this idea, and I also want to want you to see what this idea tries to cover up. Yeah. Okay, that that's me. Uh, it's very short, but um, thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my slides, uh, Philip? Hello. Yes. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon. 
I don't know, I can't hear someone speaking. Um, so hopefully everyone can hear me and see my slides. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope to contribute to this uh, wonderful discussion, thanking my pan fellow panelists to, by bringing some uh, the Soviet and Central Asian perspective. And I'll give a brief overview of the reception of the idea of this transcontinental uh, trade uh, in the Soviet and Russian scholarship and its aftermath. Uh, in other words, how it influenced the historiography of, of Central Asia and then what purposes it serves in present. So I began by looking at the um, popularity of this term on the internet by doing a Google search, and I wasn't disappointed. The Silk Road is the most popular road nowadays, and it has overtaken all other real roads, including the long road, which can refer to any long road, or uh, indeed to a music festival in the UK and so on. And this trend is also the same in other languages, including in the German language or in Russian. And it has been an upward trend in the past decades, since 1980s, and uh, until now, it has become a very popular term. So um, I, I also ask the same question, why is the Silk Road uh, so popular and where does this originate in Russian and Soviet uh, studies? I think it's safe to assume <clears throat> or to give credit to the eminent Russian Orientalist Vasily Bartol as one of the first people to set this paradigm in the historiography of Central Asia, um, basically emphasizing the roles of Central Asian or Sovietians as having uh, monopolized the Silk Road trade and being acting as intermediary between China and the West Asia and further West. So they traded on the Silk Road, they uh, were very prosperous, and then eventually Bartov claimed in his, in his lectures that he delivered in Tashkent in 1920, 21, he claimed that later on in the 18th century, the Central Asia declined. Why did it decline? Because uh, the maritime rule developed, Western Europeans were already um, trading in the ocean, so the caravan routes were undermined and Central Asia fell into decline. And this was bought by all historians and uh, majority of historians, even nowadays, this is basically the paradigm of decline in Central Asian history. And this was also taken up by Soviet uh, historians, including Rafurov, who also uh, goes in his footsteps, and also modern historians, which I will not uh, touch upon. So then for Bartol, then this uh, decline was linked to the decline of caravan trade. But we were just told that this kind of massive caravan trade did not exist. And then he also believed in the 19th century, he believed that the Central Asian revival is linked somehow to the revival of its trade routes. And, but he still was very pessimistic that Central Asia will ever be connected through a railroad to the Far East, which actually he was uh, proved wrong in his own lifetime by the Soviet infrastructure project. So what we see in the slides here is a Soviet film that documents the, the construction of the Turkestan-Siberian uh, railway, which in fact contrasts these uh, Soviet infrastructure projects, construction of a railway and machinery with a chaotic desert and caravans and, and um, horse carts. In other words, Soviet, uh, Soviet realism had no time for these fantasies and rosy image and caravan traders. They, they just built this and they contrasted it uh, sharply with the past. And this is also characteristic as all of all, all other Soviet projects, including in Soviet's uh, way of presenting Central Asia abroad or to, to other, um, through its tourism, uh, tourism initiative. So when um, I thank also my colleagues, uh, Marcus Hauser and Zora Said, who actually led me to these uh, very fascinating um, posters and newspaper clips in Western press where uh, Soviet Union basically drawing on these Orientalist tropes, um, uh, such golden road to Turkestan and bazaars and all sorts of things. Still, they, they, the emphasis is on, emphasis is on the uh, infrastructure projects and cotton industry and so on and so forth. And the, and the five-year plan, of course. Um, but there's no talk in the Soviet period, not, not this in the same way that we have now about the Silk Road. And of course, there's 
uh, no trade with China, or it's very insignificant <coughs> at this period, Soviet Union did, that, did not have a good relationship with China. And then of, in the later Soviet period, it kind of took off a little bit. But then Soviet Union broke down, and we have all these massive initiatives that started with the, the UNWTO's uh, Silk Road Trade that Orzo mentioned, and then the Li Peng's visit to Central Asia in 1994, the Chinese premier, premier who came to Central Asia and in Uzbekistan, he stated that um, uh, in the past Uzbekistan and China traded on the Silk Road, let's open the new Silk Road. So it was Li Peng, the Chinese leader who uh, basically officially announced this in 1994, although uh, I think the, the current uh, Chinese premier uh, Xi Jinping, I think, is visiting the opening of the New Silk Road is more famous than 2013. So following this, this brand takes off and in Central Asia, of course, the Central Asian governments uh, love this idea and Central Asian people, they see this as an opportunity for themselves to somehow benefit from the world trade. They, they see it as, um, you know, giving them a place and on a piece of the pie, let's say, of the world trade, they seems each country has their own goals, but they want to, for instance, uh, build infrastructure projects, uh, you know, benefit uh, socially and economically and uh, build pipelines and, you know, railroads and basically participate in trade. And uh, this is also a project that's supported by the UN, all sorts of world tourism, tourism initiative, and in a way it, want, it is aimed at integrating the region and the governments are, and the people are somehow optimistic about it. They do not see it as a beyond the xenocentrism of the project and Eurocentrism of the whole idea. They see it as something of their own. It's, they see it as part of their national historiography, it's part of their then the myth of uh, national myth, it's part of the history they see because they are the ones who are so supposed traders on this road and it's their land at the end of the day. So I began with Bartold and I also want to end with him because he, he delivered these lectures in 1921, exactly hundred years ago. And he also um, was thinking about world trade, he thought this, the, the, the development of Central Asia, which he called Turkestan, was uh, not possible without uh, world trade, but, and he was optimistic, and I think the current, uh, present day Central Asians are also optimistic about this, but there was also pessimism, and he was more pessimistic about Chinese Turkestan, which, as we can see, is uh, turned completely the opposite way. So I'll leave it here and thank you everyone for joining in and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Aslisha, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank Aslisha and all of our colleagues for their incisive critical discussions of how our terminology um, shapes the assumptions that we carry and the questions that we're able to ask. Um, some people have already put questions into the chat, into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I'm going to um, mediate those um, uh, for the panel now. Um, Arizu, I wondered if we could start with you. Mohammed Basharat says, can the Bactrian language be decoded and how old is the language itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. The language has been deciphered by uh, largely Nicholas Sims Williams and uh, his colleagues, uh, Francois de Blois as well. Uh, but it's really Nicholas Sims Williams who has published his trans translations of these documents, which you can purchase also in books. They were published by the Khalili. Um, Khalili collections. I mean, if you search Khalili collections and Bactrian, uh, it'll it'll come up. And there are three volumes of those. How old is the language itself? Um, okay, so the documents that have been published date from the fourth to the eighth century um, of the Common Era. There are older inscriptions found in um, in in stone and so on in Afghanistan. Some of which are on display now in the National Museum of Afghanistan. Some of which are still being found. Um, as as we speak, so that's uh, that's on the Bactrian language. Thank you very much. Um, Asli show. Um, Joanna asks, um, uh, what how how have Central Asian governments used restoration projects to appropriate Silk Road history? 
Um, there has been many projects. I'm not specific. Uh, there, there, there have been, I remember there is this Silk Road destination, I think Silk Road um, milestones or landmarks that they have, um, they're basically, they, they, they add them to Silk Road heritage, I think. I'm not entirely sure about what is, is the exact term is used, but of course this leads to, you know, building these uh, gates and um, these, I think, uh, yeah, landmark of the Silk Road. I, I'm not entirely sure how this was they used, but of course we, we know that the UN is supporting these and there's a lot of funding is coming, of course. Uh, I, I cannot give a specific example, to be honest. Um, the Thank you very much. A, a question, for, a question for Khodadad. Um, Iftikhar Malik asks, um, why should we base our skepticism over the name the Silk Road just because it was coined by Europeans? Um, he suggests um, the many socio-cultural subsystems met in different ways, and doesn't the spread of Buddhism into Tibet and China um, negate the Eurocentrism that you're concerned about? Uh, I suppose um, the issue might be about the name might be more um, addressed towards what Arzu brought up. Uh, but um, the reason I'm concerned is not the, the name. The reason I'm concerned is the actual um, assumption of the existence of the road. And as uh, Zhang Zhang was showing, um, that there is a rather uh, fascinating Chinese film uh, starring uh, Jackie Chan and John Cusack. Uh, which shows uh, the Roman, uh, a Roman garrison going east to help the Chinese police the Silk Road, which not only assumes that the Chinese and the Romans were actually you know, exchanging these things and includes that 4,000 kilometers in between, it also imagines that there is a road to protect that as if there is a, a motorway going from the east to the west and we now should be just looking for archeological evidence of the pavement itself. Um, I think this such an imagination of it um, brings on what I was saying. It's Eurocentric because it imagines that the uh, terminal point of it is coming to the West. But I would repeat what Arzu was saying, that this not denying that trade existed, that things such as spread of Buddhism, the spread of Christianity eastwards uh, through the same networks that we we're talking about, uh, and the exchange of goods, of course, existed. But these are regional, local, short distance, and at, at, at best, mid-distance trade. Nothing really leaves Don Huang meaning to end up in Constantinople. It leaves Don Juan meaning to end up, say, in Kashgar, say, in Samarkand. The problem is the imagination that the road exists as a continuous um, uh, sort of transportation uh, means, taking things from China to the West and taking supposedly Western uh, riches in the sense of cash eastward to China and ignoring the fact that populations in between, such as those Tibetans and others, who are spreading those beliefs have actually an agency of their own and that they are not historically static and stagnant, but rather dynamic and actually participants in the production of the culture and not just means in, in between. Thank you very much. A question now for um, Zhang Zhang. Um, is there any local or international road or sea project that has the potential to challenge the popularity of the OBOR? Uh, I don't really understand this question. Well, let's, uh, local um, international road C pro. Oh, oh, I see. You mean other countries? I assume I, so. Uh, I think the U.S. is trying to to unite with its friends to counter China. Mm. But this is all political. Yeah, they will come up with another good name. I'm sure. <laughs> There's a question for Arizun now. Um, uh, Joanna asks if you could comment on the role of microhistory as a springboard to deeper analysis. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think microhistory is not a replacement of grand history at all, but I think we need to look at the two together. So you can look at 
big histories that talk universal histories as they're often called and so on. But you need to definitely cross check that with what you find at the local level. So yes, I, I completely agree that uh, exactly as Ginsburg does it, you go to the local level, but you don't stay in the local level. From the local level, then you can extrapolate again. But I think you do have to go to the local level because particularly this region is so diverse. You have so many people speaking so many different languages, using different scripts, following different religions, um, living in highlands, living in valleys, living in so many different um, ecological, uh, environments that you you have to uh, be a lot more specific um, and again when you've gone to the local level you can't necessarily extrapolate for the whole region right you, you, you're going to need to think uh, where there might be um, sensible parallels um, but yeah so it's a lot more you need to be a lot more methodical is my point on that if I might add something to that, um, I think this is the this is sort of on our uh, modern his, um, approaches as historians that we imagine that micro history uh, that micro history is by definition myopic and uh, concentrating on few sources, and that big picture history, universal history, is by nature vague and blurring differences. I think there is a lot to say for what lies in between. We don't necessarily global history, I always say to my students, doesn't have to be the history of the globe. It's the history of a village, but with the context of the globe. So we very much can be using Bactrian documents from a um, couple of villages north of Bamiyan in Afghanistan, which is what they are in fact but see them within a global context. So I don't think there is a conflict. And I think people like Sanjay Subramaniam and others are doing a good job of uh, marrying the two. So it's not really the polarization of, um, uh, I don't know, Sebastian Konrad versus Carla Ginsburg. Uh, most of us actually do lie in between. Thank you very much. Sarah Lloyd Nibs asks, how consistent are the connotations of the Silk Road between different stakeholders, such as tourist boards, politicians, journalists, and members of the public? Would anyone like to take that question? Um, maybe me? I think that's pretty consistent. Uh, everybody uh, tacitly sees this uh, word as some, some peaceful, nice cultural exchange. Uh, and yeah. I can, I can add to that. I think, yes, yeah. that I agree with John. This is more or less the case. Most people see it, you know, it serves the purpose. It is nice, uh, rosy image and, and everyone likes it. But there's also a skepticism on the part of this. Of course, Russia, uh, the US, for instance, is also open to the idea, but they have this skepticism, Russia as well. They are skeptical about the role that China is going to play in this. And that is what I think we'll see is the difference about this. But it's not uh, as such a different view on Silk Road, but rather, you know, different concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and Peter Frankopan asks, how should we best decenter Silk Road histories away from urban settle settlements and metropolitan narratives to be more inclusive? So, how, how, can we, how can we produce more inclusive histories of the Silk Road? This is a question for Arazu and Khodadad, uh, whichever of you would like to take that up. I would uh, say ladies first, so Arazu can go first. <laughs> okay, let me just make sure I understand this question. Um, lovely to get one from Peter. Should we decenter so away from urban? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, no, no, really good. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel like that's what we do in our Invisible East program just by by default, because our so the sources that we're working with are very local documents that were written largely outside of big urban settlements. So the Afghan ones I showed you towards the end of my talk, they come from very small places that we can't find um, on maps, even on historical maps. So they're really village level. So that's, I think that, uh, so working with documents is definitely a way uh, forward. The Bactrian documents equally, they don't come from the big city like Baal, which is the nearest big city. 
it's it's on it's hardly even mentioned in over 200 documents it appears once and only in a tangential comment um, so these documents the bactrian ones from the 8th century in particular that we're interested in um but even the earlier ones they all come from this region of of rope which is several it's about 140 miles or so away from Bauch, but that doesn't mean that these are sort of teeny weeny little places that are not integrated um, within the region. Um, in fact, um, from the Bactrian documents, we get a sense of these documents coming from what looks like a rural metropolis. You know, you have the landowners from whom probably a number of these documents archives come, who are um, sort of rural. Uh, landlords with land, with power, with money lending uh, capacities, um, and who who are linking up with with their peers in nearby rural metropolises. But um, so so I think documents are definitely um, helping us. Equally, the Middle Persian documents I showed you from Iran, they are also not from big cities, um, from smaller places. And so all of these documents um, we're working with, uh, and I think that's a good way to start. If I might add, I think it has to do with the nature of the, the decentering really has to do um, with how we look at the economy. We have an easy time thinking of ancient economy as trade, because trade is quantifiable, and economy being a, a social science that pretends it's uh, an exact science, likes numbers. So we overemphasize commerce, but I think the way to decenter it is to realize that much of the economy is production and much of the um, production is consumed locally. And this um, econ uh, economic production is mostly agricultural. Uh, and in this sense, I, while the documents, as Arzu mentioned, a lot of them do talk about um, these rural productions, I think archaeology and uh, other matters such as land surveys could be quite useful for us to balance off what we see from these documents or many other uh, narratives which are urban based uh, because they are overemphasizing trade. So I think decentering the entire narrative of the Silk Road also has to do with decentering the um, story of commerce and trade and understanding economy largely as a matter of local production. So I think if we take one last question, um, Stefan Pradin asks, what is the role of Islam in the trading routes? I think he means both maritime and overland trading routes. So is there a role for religion, especially Islam, in facilitating trade? Would anyone like to take that last question? What is meant by Islam? Well, um, that's for you to define. I think there might be a, because again, we are overemphasizing um, trade. Um, I think there might be an understanding that under the early Islamic system, there is a unification of various economic zones, namely North Africa and Eastern Mediterranean, which was under the Byzantine. Uh, and uh, with Iran, which was under the Sasanians, and possibly parts of the Central Asia, which is, by the way, uh, another issue in to, uh, looking at this thing. This Central Asia that we are talking about is really Islamic Transoxiana. Um, it, it really stops where 750, the Battle of Talas, stops as well. Um, so maybe this um, uh, sort of um, unification of economic zones can be attributed to the Islamic system. I'm not sure how much it really uh, facilitates trade. It certainly reroutes it for the first couple of centuries until uh, I would imagine the rise of um, uh, silver production in Central Asia, again, reroutes the uh, part of uh, the trade uh, to the steppe land. Um, so yes, in a sense, uh, at least the rise of the Islamic Caliphate creates um, the, a, a, a rerouting and a redirection of uh, trade uh, routes. But uh, I'm not sure in the long run we could really say much about it. Mm. Thank you. Um, we're, we're over time, but I think if we I could have one last question. Um, Khurshid Khan asks, as Lisho, do you see any link between the 
history of colonization and the decline in the popularity of the Silk Road? Um, yeah, I, th I think Porsche means the decline of the popularity in the Soviet Union. Um, as I mentioned, I think it's it had to do with the Soviet Union, be it not very you know famous for free trade and also the confrontation with China. It, for majority of this time, of course, in the 30s, there's war. China is in sort of in disarray. The Second World War in the 50s, the trade picks a little bit, but then again, there's China Soviet crisis. The trade is completely um, close between the two big uh, countries. And then in the 80s, there's a little bit of like, you know, we let's start trading, let's start trading, but then it doesn't help. So the, the volume of trade is completely, it's, uh, it's very little. And then, yeah, Soviet Union breaks down. So it's just the Soviet, um, Soviet China relations that actually, yeah, doesn't facilitate this idea. It doesn't, um, Soviet Union doesn't want to talk about the, um, the, the Silk Road as far as they can see um, that is, makes sense. Thank so, you for this um, question. Thank you, thank you to, the, to everyone who's attended and thank you to all the panelists. Um, I think we've had a really interesting discussion and um, I, I look forward to um, seeing you all at another event in, this, um, uh, in the Aga Khan's uh, series on, on the Silk Road. So thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, Philip, and thanks, Sarah, for uh, organizing this wonderful event. Yes, thank you so much, and thank you to all the participants. <laughs>